I misheard when you said 70 years of experience? I'm not. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right. um, okay, so I love interaction. I really crave it. Can everyone hear me okay? I hate mics. It's just kind of annoying. I'm okay to talk louder. If you need me to talk louder, please let me know. I also love it when you interrupt me, so please interrupt me. Ask questions because entrepreneurship is something that is near and dear to my heart. Building innovation ecosystems is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, do you need to make a comment? I guess uh, we should have a. Uh, do we? Yeah, the voice is Oh, the voice is a little bit low? <laughs> On that side. Ah, okay, all right, I will, I will wear it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and if I constantly whack it, I'm really sorry. Because <laughs> that's just what I do. <laughs> anyway, so what I wanted to mention is, um, uh, as we look at doing innovation, entrepreneurship, it's something that takes a lot of work. You know, and how much work? It's a hell of a lot of work. It really is. But it's really, really rewarding. And there are a lot of fun challenges. There's a lot of fun opportunities. And it takes everyone's ideas, everyone's input, anyway, everyone's thoughts and brain power to make all of this work. Yes, that's why I don't like these. All right. Um, so anyway, please interrupt me. Uh, so I, I want to, this is just an outline of what I want to go over. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about me, what a business is, problems, needs, benefits, risks, um, what we do at the Idea Center, and then talk about how to build an innovation ecosystem. It, oh, that is the problem. Got it. All right, so, and, and why it is we want to build an innovation ecosystem. In fact, it's really fascinating. The National Science Foundation just released a new directorate on building innovation ecosystems, had an opportunity to meet with them last week and talk about how important it is that universities are involved in building innovation ecosystems. So, fun stuff. Um, so, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I'm a cell biologist by classical education. Uh, I went to school thinking I wanted to be a doctor. Um, a lot of people at Notre Dame, I understood, I stand at Notre Dame, that's like the number one, um, what undergraduate degree focus is medicine. I thought that was fascinating. So I wanted to be a doc, uh, decided against it when I got it, at that stupid time, I got into medical school and I had an offer to um, a scholarship and go to be a scientist, so I turned it down, became a scientist. Uh, love it. I've also started a bunch of companies um, and been associated with multiple universities. So, um, associated with University of Utah most recently, there helped build out their commercialization engine and operation. Uh, we were very fortunate that um, there was a national ranking group that ranked us, uh, you know, top of the country in commercialization. So that was really nice. And then Notre Dame contacted us and said. Why in the heck is this Podunk Little Research University in Utah doing this and recruited us to come here? Um, so very, very fortunate. Um, I, I'm on the board of multiple different companies. These are lo uh, logos of some of the companies I'm on the board of, uh, as well as companies I've started. Um, so just highlighting a few interesting ones, uh, Granis Therapeutics. Granis Therapeutics is based on technology developed in the Black Lab. Uh, do you know Brian Black? Yeah. I don't know if anyone knows Brian Black. Anyway, Brian Black is heat shock proteins. Um, we had worked, we worked on this technology for about two years now, and just recently we got the company up and going, and they raised a million dollars. Uh, so they're off and running. We have two companies, two venture capital firms, that have said, if you hit your objectives in the seed round, then we're raising the Series A. We're leading the Series A, which that's a good signal. Which means. The Series A is going to be something on the order of 15 to 20 million dollars. So really good signals. All the way over to another really fun one, Energy Innovation Services. This is a company I started um, three and a half years ago when the price of oil wasn't so fluctuating. We started the company, we had great sales, it was awesome. We had a four person operation in Bakersfield, California. Things were looking really good and then the price of oil went to crap. Uh, COVID hit went to crap. Uh, we shut that one down a year ago. It was a big failure, um, but I learned a lot from it. Great experiences. What I wanted to do is highlight 
how important it is to recognize that failures aren't necessarily a bad thing. You actually learn more from your failures than you do from those successes. And it's really important to accept, as an entrepreneur, um, that it's okay to fail. All right, so, so I want to talk a little bit about what a business really is. So I want to ask you guys, what, what do you see a business to be? I put up the slide just in case you wanted to know what my thoughts. <laughs> What's a business? You know, they feel a need. Or need. Yeah, it feels a need. It feels a need. You know, it's really interesting. So based on this, so a business, all a business really does is fill a need. That's exactly it. Um, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, they fill a need. Um, and, and, you know, it's just fascinating how many businesses get this wrong. In fact, number one reason why businesses fail in the country today, they don't <coughs> solve a need that people care about. It's actually really interesting. So Tom Eisman um, from Harvard Business School, uh, he wrote an interesting um, uh, book a year ago on why startups fail. He's coming for Idea Week, by the way. So if people want to meet him and talk to him about this, and the top three reasons, uh, good idea, bad team, which we do see, and then the other two really are, they didn't validate the problem or they sold the solution instead of validating the problem. But in the end, they didn't solve a need. Nobody cared. Happens a lot. Google losses, who cared? Uh, so yeah, you're essentially solving a problem. Then I also wanted to mention that what, what a company really is, is a company is an accumulation of risks and it's an accumulation of benefits. Now I know I'm oversimplifying, but I gotta tell you, this is the approach that we take at the Idea Center and it works really well. You just look at what are all the risks that a company has, what are all the benefits, and then you compare the two. And if the risks outweigh the benefits, you kill it, you move on. Uh, if the benefits outweigh the risks, good, then you go forward. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about <coughs> now problems. Um, anyone remember the movie Robots? Big Weld? I, I, my kids love that show. I love it too. I think it's really awesome. What did Big Well usually say? I heard over here somebody who knew. What, I just watched it like last week. <laughs> what does Big Well usually say? Like, we can do it, right? See a need, fill a need. Oh, yes, we can. And see, yes, thank you. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. I know I put you on the spot. Honestly, it happens to me all the time. I get put on the spot and all the blood kind of rushes to my <coughs> muscles instead of my brain. And I'm like, what, what, what? Anyway, so sorry to put you on the spot. See a need, fill a need. That really is it. So businesses, once again, they, they solve problems. You see a need, you fill a need. You want to make sure it's a need that people are willing to pay for. So I've got to ask you all, what is the need that your cell phone device covers, your smartphone device? I'm I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like the login system we have to use on campus, so we can do literally anything. It's silly. Okay, got it, got it. So Okta is the purpose. <laughs> I, I hate the authentications. It's a pain in the butt. But. Yeah, but if you don't have a smartphone, you can't do it. True. That's actually true. So, so hey, why do we have our smartphone then? If you say if you don't have Okta, you can't do it. Why, why do we need Okta? Why do we need the smartphone? And, like, why is it that we buy it? Access to information. We access information, exactly. Why did we include the camera? Why did the manufacturers include the camera? Why did Apple <coughs> include the camera? It was Apple that put it in. Um, Samsung was in there as well, pretty close. There was a really interesting market signal that they failed. Why do you think the camera? Kids. Yeah. So the kids, go ahead, expand on that. Uh, Kyle? Yeah, uh, you know, if you have a little one-year-old, you're running around, you're not gonna be able to go grab your camera out of the closet. You want what's convenient and on you, and your camera is there. That's exactly it. They found that the majority of the time when you go to take pictures, you don't have your camera with you. You do have your phone. Put it on there, take a picture. Didn't even matter if it was low res. Some of those low res images, I remember taking with my first smartphone. Oh my gosh, they were. <laughs> <They're>, I still <coughs> love them because I was able to take the picture. It solves a need. There was a reason why they did it. They solved the need. In fact, I remember talking to Ian Rogers. Ian Rogers was part of the, the group at Apple that 
produced the iPhone. He then also went on to ring and uh, got into politics, and that's where it started. He went quiet. Um, but uh, as with anyone in politics, they should just be quiet, but it's okay. Um, so, you know, talking to him, he said, a lot of people think that when we did the iPhone, that it was disruptive technology, and with, with disruptive technologies, you can't validate a need. You know, there's actually a few books that have been written about this. Oh, disruptive technologies, it's hard to identify the need. And he said, that's, that's crap. That's totally false. He said, we knew the need that we were solving when we built the iPhone. We just didn't sell the solution because they couldn't understand the solution. Because the solution isn't something that they were thinking about, but they all had the needs. They had the needs to access information. They had the needs to be organized. They had the needs for a camera. So businesses are all about needs. So, okay, what about this product up in the top left? It's a weighted blanket. What needs do a weighted blanket have? Anxiety. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly, no, that, that's exactly it. You know, you initially you think about it and you go, why, why do I need a weighted blanket? And then um, the, you know, my wife got me one and man, I like it. <laughs> it's actually really nice. Exactly, that's it. It's not something that you would think. So if you're a blanket manufacturer, do you think you're selling a product for the purpose of anxiety? You know, it doesn't, it, it, it's a little different. Okay, so how do you then know the needs that your customers have or your potential customers have? How do you know the needs that they have? Doing a survey, like asking other people? Yes, you ask them. <laughs> uh, so about, uh, it was in 2012, 2013, two individuals, Steve Meyer, uh, sorry, uh, Steve Blank and Eric uh, Reese came up with a really radical new concept. Uh, so Steve Blank was at uh, UC, uh, UC San Francisco. Um, Eric Reese, I thought he was with Harvard. They came up with this really brilliant new concept called the Lean Launchpad Methodology. And it's, uh, they've got this great methodology that they do. And the National Science Foundation adopted it, by the way. And the National Institutes of Health adopted it. In fact, they love to see this information in your grant proposal. You talk to program directors about the Lean Launchpad methodology, they know it. The NSF calls it i -Core. Now, the whole premise of this program is you talk to the customers. That's it. That's really it. Find out who your customer is, talk to them. And it's fascinating that the National Science Foundation adopted it as one of their core principles. It's actually something I think that those researchers that take note of it and recognize it and build this into their grants, they are more successful in getting those grants. So we need to solve needs. I want to talk now about the benefits of a business, and these are probably a little more obvious. You're looking at the benefits, you're saying, all right, well, um, let's look at the size of the market. And Launchpad, Lean Launchpad, did something also really simple. And they basically just said, to determine the size of your market, just determine who your customer is. Okay, all right, so our customer are anxious people on a weighted blanket, all right. Well, how many people are anxious? Um, and then how much would they buy? And that's your market. Like it's just really simple. Those are the fundamentals of the business. And that gives you an indication as to how many of these products you'd be able to sell. So how many customers are there? How much are they going to buy in a year? And then it really just comes down to how much will it cost you to make it, and what are you going to charge them? Now, I, I, I know these seems like really gross oversimplifications, but i got to tell you, that's what they teach them in Mendoza. And it's kind of funny. It takes them two years to do it. But, um, you know, I, I can't do it. <laughs> Sorry, the scientist in me just has to razz them, you know, just a little bit. Um, so, now, the other part of this, of course, that we, we have um, a lot of benefits, but then businesses also have risks. And unfortunately, this is where it does get to be a little more complicated. Um, so there's a lot of risks that we have here. Uh, you can have a lot of really strong competition, and nobody cares about why you're different. Something that I've learned over uh, about 25 years in business is that um, when it comes, this sounds really bad, but I'm just going to be open about it. Nobody cares. Customers don't care about the environment, and they don't care about your quality or your customer service unless it's really, 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 really bad. That's it. So you can tell customers, look, I have a great customer service, and I'm helping the environment, 
and my quality is absolutely amazing, and they are not going to pay a penny more for it. It is what it is. So just understand what your competitive advantage is and what people really care about. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Please, please, sir. No, he, he, he does. No, please. Uh, uh, please sorry. Push, I love it. I'm visiting campus, but I do a fair amount, and as I just raised as a very good, timely example. The Europeans would not pay a penny more for US LNG versus Russian gas. Yeah. Yes, isn't it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now we just, but by the way, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a focus on the environment. What it means is you need to look at the value proposition, why you're different, and build it as a part of it. Use an economic incentive for the customers. Make it a part of what is your focus, your thrust, um, and if saving in the environment is a good component of it, that's great. You, you know, um, but yeah, when it comes down to it, nobody wants to pay extra for it. Just the way it is. Yeah, the comment I was making was it needs to be still a part of your, you know, the culture you advertise for your company. Abs <clears throat> very, very important. You're absolutely right. So my point is to when I talk to individuals who are really cognizant of the environment, and look, I care about it as well, and uh, it's something I, I'm. Uh, actually registered Native American. I know I don't look at it. Uh, two generations of Scandinavian women, and that's what you got. But, um, you know, it's something that's really, really important to me, saving the environment. My position is, look, don't just come out and say, buy my product because I'm going to the environment. <coughs> actually come up with a better reason why they should do it. Find out exactly what the customer really cares about, and make sure you do it better than anyone else. Solve their problem. Ask them what their real pain is and convince them by solving the pain that they should pay for it. And, and by the way, that's one of the biggest challenges a lot of these companies do is they try to take on strong competition with environmental as the only differential. I'm saying it to this group as Notre Dame Energy because I'm saying, look, that's the way you get to the market. That's the way you change the world. Um, you can also have really expensive or hard to reach customers, uh, which happens a lot. Like there's a, there's, that was a company that we evaluated. A student had a really great idea to go and um, create a marketplace for auto paint. Um, and then you'd be able to go to one marketplace instead of having to go to the different distributors. I mean, that's really great. But there's no big auto body shops that are expansive throughout the entire country. Most of them are just mom and pop operations. And they don't go to a central uh, convention. And many of them don't use the internet, um, so you've got to go direct sales approach. It's just hard to get to. Um, intellectual property, regulatory, cost, customer validation, um, and then this one we talked a little bit about it. Good idea, bad bet fellows. The reason why I brought this in here is um, have a technology that did great. It went through the idea center, and we validated a real problem a real pain in the marketplace. Anyone know the company Frost Control Systems? All right, you probably wouldn't know about them. There are temperature sensors that are found in South Bend, as well as about 300 municipalities in the Midwest that just do one simple thing. When it's cold out, they measure the temperature of the road, and then they take a picture of that, and they send it to the individuals who are doing the snow plows, and they apply salt. And it just says, you should apply salt, or don't worry about it, you're still good. Municipalities adopted this. They found that they were able to reduce their salt consumption by 8%. Now, why do we care? Salt in the Midwest is the number two, uh, it's the second largest budget item in municipalities second to people only. An 8% reduction is huge, absolutely huge. Okay, so this company, we went out, we sent the products out to the municipalities, and the thought was, you don't have to buy the sensors, guys. All you have to do is, guys, gals, people, all you have to do is put them up, we'll pay for the sensors, and then you pay for the data. Really, really cool. So, company has $1.13 million in contracts right now. That's awesome. So, uh, we invested in it. So, I invested in the company and um, in one of the funds I'm a partner on, put about $900,000 into it. Yay, this is great. The uh, Monday, last Monday, everyone called and quit. 
everyone. The board, the president, the employees, except for one, one production guy. He's got seven kids, he's a really nice guy. They all quit. Look, we got 1.13 million, so I, thought, I immediately thought, hey, okay, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna resurrect this, this is gonna be awesome, and I think it's gonna look really good. We look and we realize that every single one of the products that we've installed only lasts a year because they put a lid on the top, the gasket fails, and honest to goodness, it's weird, I know they were shocked, but it gets really cold here and that beats the crap out of gaskets. So every single one of the products failed, and it would cost us a million dollars to replace all the products um, and service and get 1.13 million, and then we have to redo the entire product line. <laughs> I'm shutting the company down. Have to. Anyway, good idea, bad people. What we found was the engineer, engineer was a good person, great person, loved the engineer to death, um, just thought, well, I want that battery because I know how to process that battery. Well, that battery was on a 3.2 or 3.3 volt system, whereas other uh, conventional parts are on a 5 volt system. So it meant that if he used that battery, he had to use other components, which meant the only enclosure he could use was the one that was upside down with the lid on the top. <laughs> that failed. Anyway, good idea, bad execution. All right, so then, when I talk about then what you do, you get the risks, you look at the benefits, and you compare them. And by the way, this is what we do. If you have inventions, this is exactly what we do to help you. You just compare then the benefits, and the benefits outweigh the risks. If it is a yes, we go forward. If it's a no, you don't go forward. And no, it, it, simplification, I know, but that's exactly how we do this. And now I want to talk a little bit about why is it that we start companies. So at the Idea Center, um, we focus on companies. That's what we do. We focus on starting companies. Now we also focus on licensing technology. So we help students like yourself, postdocs, graduate students, um, faculty members for those faculty in the, the room. We help you to take your great innovations and bring them out and make an impact in the market. Um, if you make a good impact, then you also make money. But our number one goal is to make an impact. We really want to change the world based on the research that you're doing. So that it, it doesn't just become a good poster, an awesome poster that people love, but it actually changes the world. Um, and you, know, you may ask, well, why is it that we don't take these really great ideas and go out to existing companies and say, hey, uh, Lily, we've got this really cool tech from Brian Black, and it's really awesome. Why don't you license this from us, and then you commercialize that technology? Well, there's really something that, that we, we call the golden rule, and that's if you have the gold, you make the rules. And we realized this about 10, 12 years ago. 10, 12 years ago, there's a really interesting um, dynamic that's going on in the public markets and in large companies. So you have your uh, management, your C-suite leadership in these large corporations. So you're the CEO of Lilly. Uh, your salary is usually pretty small. Your bonus is usually really, really big. And the bonus is paid off of your share prices. It's paid off of how much profit the company is making, if that makes sense. Um, and like, to put it into comparison, uh, I had a brother who um, was the chief operating officer of SkyWest Airlines, largest regional airline, and he had a salary of like $250,000, but his bonus could be up to $2 million. And the bonus was based off of profit and loss. It was based on profit and loss. Okay, so if you're looking at profit and loss, and you, by the way, R&D comes into that. Your research expenses come into that. So you're thinking, all right, how do I boost this up because I want to buy that really nice car. I want to I make more money. What do you do with the R&D budget? You cut it. Or if you have a university that comes to you and says, here's a really cool technology, please take this, and then it's going to take about a million dollars in research. Are you inclined to take it on? No, because it hurts your budget. Now the other part of this that's really fascinating is we learned that in these large corporations, acquisitions is how they acquire new products. And acquisitions do not come out of the profit and loss. Acquisitions don't impact their bonus. 
So what's interesting is that when you see this, just an interesting trend is companies are cutting R&D and instead they're buying companies for their new product pipeline. That's how they expand. Um, now, this is a gross simplification, I get that, but you're seeing that trend. Look at it, look at the companies and see what they do and see how many of those companies are acquiring. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Most major corporations have an entire division dedicated just on acquisitions. Okay, so if now we know they're acquiring companies, how do we get our technologies to the company, to the large corporations? What do you think? Make your own company and then they buy you. That's right. That's exactly right. We start companies. So that's why we start companies. I'm just being completely honest. By the way, we still try to license the tech. And yes, we did go out to every major pharmaceutical company with Granish Therapeutics and say, would you license this? Zero. What they said was, come back to us when you've got really good talks data. Like, well, if I have really good talks data, I'm not going back to you. I'm actually doing this myself. <laughs> so we went out, we raised a million dollars to go get the talks data, and then we had the investors that said, yeah, you get it. We'll push you, and then we're just going to make the pharma companies um, pay 20 times what they could have paid. Yay, <laughs> we'll make the difference. Anyway, that's what it is. Reduced R&D, better profit, acquisitions don't hit the P&L, that's it. That's the whole point. So existing companies, they want de-risk technologies, which really just means they want sales. So your products that you're developing right now, your great innovations, there are awesome innovations. We just have to think that when you go to an existing company, they're gonna say, all right, well, what are your sales? Well, it's a new technology, I don't have it yet. So that's why we deploy the companies. So let's fit into this, it, it gives you a strategic advantage. A patent is a negative right. It gives you the ability, Zoe, um, Zoe, you have a patent, um, and Eli Lilly is doing something that your patent covers. You get to tell them, no, you can't do that. It's actually a pretty big deal to be able to tell that if a large corporation has a huge product line based on that patent, they can't do it. So that's a huge economic incentive for them to buy you, or to buy the patent, or to license the patent. So that's where patents get, it's a negative right. Yes? So do you have to sell the patent, or do they have to rent it? Like, is it just, oh, I need to get permission from you to use your patent, and you get some money out of it? Yeah, so the renting, that's a license. Okay. That's, what, that's all it is. I'm going to give you the right to use this patent, and in exchange, you're going to give me some money up front, some money every year, and a percentage of everything that you sell. That's nice. It is. It really is good. It's actually great if they develop a product that you have a patent on. That doesn't happen very often. Um, in fact, I did an analysis. I had somebody, uh, it was, uh, this is a little dated now. It's like three years old. So three years old, I had a friend of mine, uh, three years ago, sorry, I had a friend who had a really interesting database. He scanned through the US Patent and Trademark database and he said, I, I told him, I I'm interested in how many universities have actually sold, like, like assigned the technology to a company. And uh, any ideas how many at that time? Five. Two. <laughs> Two. Uh, one of them was actually in one of our um, outlying areas. It wasn't even a state. It was Puerto Rico. So I thought that was really interesting. They just don't. So normally what a large company will do is before they go to develop a product, they'll look at the intellectual property and say, do I infringe on anyone else? And then they'll try to work around it. They'll tell their development people, don't do that. So we could have a patent on it, and this happens to us. We'll have a patent, and if we don't do anything with that patent, a large corporation will look at it and say, all right, Notre Dame did that work. Uh, don't do that, work around it. I did it in one of the companies I was in. I was head of business development for Frontier Chemical. We would go out, we'd search the, um, the, the, the web for patents, and we'd just go to our chemists and say, okay, just don't do that, but I want the end result. It's legal, perfectly legal. So what I'm saying is, let's take that patent and let's not just patent it and put it on a shelf and wait for somebody to call us, because they don't call. Let's move it forward. And how can you move it forward? I mean, like, what, what do you, okay, I, I have a product, yeah. I patent it, and then what do you do? You just go to a company and be like, hey, 
Would you like to make this? <laughs> no, I, it, it's a great point. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your... Uh, Stephania. Stephania, Stephania, great point. I, I'm so glad you asked that. So the first thing that you do is you're going to look at who the customer is. Who is that customer, the WeChat customer? Then you're going to look at what do you think their, their main pain is, the problem that they have. And you go out and talk to the customer, and you validate the pain. Then you look at what it's going to cost to actually build the product, and then um, take that product, once you build it, back to the customer and say, is this what you wanted? Does this solve your pain, your problem? Um, and then you manufacture the product and then sell it. Once you've got sales, then you go to the large corporation and say, hey, I've got sales. Um, and by the way, normally what happens is they'll come to you before you come to them and say, are you interested in us buying you out or a partnership? Um, and all the things I just said, that's what we do at the Idea Center. So you can come to us with your invention. We'll do all that work. We'll work with you, show you how to do it, um, give you the real world experience. In fact, we find that there's scientists and engineers that work with us that have innovations from their faculty's lab, um, or they have their own ideas, and we show them how to do this, and we're finding that many of them are getting better job offers from corporations saying, well, look, you know how to do that. Why don't you just come work for us and do it? <laughs> uh, one of the individuals I tried to hire and uh, oh my gosh, it was a bit. He just came to me. I, I, I said, Look, I'd love for you to. You're awesome. You've been working with us for a year now. I, we have an opening at the Idea Center. Um, would you like to come work? And he just said, um, Their offer is a couple, multiple times more than two year offer. Sorry. <laughs> that's a good thing. I actually thought that was a very good thing. So now yeah, that's exactly how we do it. Now I skipped a few steps. <laughs> anyway, um, but essentially what happens is we are now seeing this as an opportunity for startups to make money. And the cool thing about it is there's a whole group of people who have money who have said, I want to actually make more money. I want to make more money than I can make if I invest my money in the stock market or in real estate. So they'll give you those dollars so you can develop the product. And then they own a percentage of your company. And then when you sell, they make the money back. We've already had two companies exit uh, in the last couple of years. We are anticipating more. Now, where licensing works, licensing does work um, if you have research reagents, um, chemicals, biologics. You know, um, there's companies out there. We'll license those all day long. And in fact, it's actually really fun. This year, our deal flow is three times in licenses what it has been in the past, primarily with uh, research reagents and commercial research collaborations. And then I do also throw in therapeutics. Um, therapeutics is another really interesting area that you will see big pharma license periodically. Um, it's just periodically. So again, now we're talking about startups, and we're talking about how important that is. And um, I want to now talk about another reason why the Idea Center is here. So when, when uh, we were first recruited, myself, our Vice President Brian Ritchie, and a few others, uh, had an opportunity to sit down with John Affleck Graves and Tom Birch, the, execs, uh, the Executive Vice President at the time, the Provost. And you know, we, we tried to do customer validation as well and ask. I said, OK, you brought us here. You're investing in the Idea Center. What do you want? What problem are we going to solve? And John said something that's always stuck with me. Well, we realized it's too expensive to move the Golden Dome. So we're here in this area. We have a problem that when we <coughs> extend an offer to a faculty member, the faculty member is excited. And there's many of those in here that have these issues, and they say, wow, Notre Dame. Oh, it's in South Bend. <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to put down South Bend. So the whole point of that is, all right, we're never going to move the dome. So what do we do? How do we solve that problem? We build the ecosystem here. So let's become a really big focus of mine. I've really taken this on, and I've really, I've, I've had the blessed opportunity to work with a lot of different municipalities in the country, as well as a lot of different um, countries. Uh, last year, I spent most of May uh, for, right, for the State Department in Colombia, analyzing their innovation ecosystem, identifying ways that they can move forward. And it's really been fun to see there, there's, there, there's some really cool, um, benefits of an innovation ecosystem. So we're going to talk about what the benefits are, and then I want to go into the model that we've developed to build innovation ecosystems that we're focusing on here in this area. So first off, um, you have a whole lot of inventors 
that are building really cool products. You have a lot of companies that are hiring lots of people at really, really high salaries. This is what a, an innovation ecosystem looks like. You have a large number of entrepreneurs that are out there starting companies. You have uh, a large number of investors that are funding those companies. In fact, if you want to meet them, you just go down to a coffee shop and there are investors there and there are entrepreneurs there and there's inventors. You have companies being acquired by large corporations and your industry base is very diversified. You're not just in RV sales. Okay, does that describe self -bend? Not yet. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Thank you, Ian. Not yet. That's exactly it. Not yet. So how are we going to get there? Uh, so this is the equation that we put together, um, and we're in the process of just putting papers together and, and doing some fun validation. You're going to identify the problem, and you're going to research the solution. You're going to develop and then disclose that invention. And our proposal is that it actually works if you work with a tier one research university. So Notre Dame's a tier one research university. We do great research. You are the ones who do the great research. You then disclose it. We help you. This is the key part of it. It's the people in the process, the people who roll up their sleeves and help you to de-risk the product. You evaluate the risks. You evaluate the benefits. You understand the biggest risks to moving forward. You mitigate them. Or if you can't mitigate them, and the risk is too high at that point, move on. You advance it to the point, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. You advance it to the point where you can recruit an entrepreneur to run the company. Notice I didn't say the inventor runs the company. Something we just learned. Inventors are really good at inventing. Entrepreneurs are really good at entrepreneuring, sorry, starting businesses. So that's what we do. Find an entrepreneur. In a rare case, the inventor could be the entrepreneur. Um, doesn't happen a lot. You start a company, you then record, recruit a board of directors. Something I love about Notre Dame is our alumni are amazing. They are very qualified. You are going to all be the alumni in the future, so you're going to be successful and do amazing things. It's going to be great. And those alumni who came before you, you stand on their shoulders, they're willing to come back and help you and be on your board of directors and mentor you, most often for nothing. Investors then invest in your companies. We've got an investor network of about 250 angel investors who will write checks. Last year we had eight or nine, I keep going back and forth, <clears throat> companies that raised between a half a million to $1.6 million each. Um, I think last year our companies in aggregate raised $35 million, uh, just last year alone. Then those companies that you have a board and you have a validated problem and you need employees to build the product, so you hire employees. Then they sell products and they go out and make money. Yay, that's awesome. And then the final point is you sell your company and then the entrepreneurs become the next generation of, it, of investors and the employees you hire become the next generation of entrepreneurs and then it just goes back and forth now, and so on. Kind of simple, isn't it? <laughs> that's really it. I, I would just, it's not that hard. Um, now, so this is where Idea Center comes and fits in. So here, this is what you do. So you're going to research the problems, identify the solutions, um, and you're going to develop and disclose inventions. This is what the Idea Center will help you do. We'll help you do that. Help you get the company up. We'll help you recruit the entrepreneur. If you want to be the entrepreneur, great, come. Be the entrepreneur. We'll help you. We'll guide you. We'll mentor you. We'll find mentors for you. Get you to the point where Investors will invest in the company. Now from there, it can also go bad. Remember Frost. But still, that's fine. Um, we're finding that 75% right now of all the companies that we started, based on faculty, staff, inventions, and graduate students, are still alive. And that's going up. Um, there were a group of companies that brought our percentage down when we first started that were here, legacy companies, and we worked through them, and there were some that just needed to be closed. Uh, whereas the student companies, 50% are alive. But that's fine. If you have an idea, come to us, let us help you, and we can de-risk your company, your idea, in the safe environment of the university. And think about this. You're still a student, so you know if the company fails, you're not out anything. In fact, you get the experience. So come and fail in the safe environment of the university with us. And then you can learn so much more. And learning is the key. 
In fact, there was a recent book, um, Super Founders, by Ali Tanizab. Sorry, I slaughtered his last name. Anyway, Ali, he's coming for Idea Week as well. And in this book, he wanted to highlight um, who are the founders of billion dollar companies. So you've heard the name unicorns? Unicorns are billion dollar companies. If a company had a billion dollar valuation, they considered you a unicorn. And he had the thought, well, are unicorns traditionally the founded by the college kids in hoodies who, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, the Sergey Brins? Um, and what he found was, no, they're not. Those are actually the exceptions. In fact, they're really the only exceptions. Uh, founders of unicorns, they found an average of six companies, and they're 45 years old. So our point is, OK, you can't do anything about the age, but you can do something about the number of companies. Get the experience while you're here at the university. We'll help you do it. So Bruce, you, you guys also help with the disclose and We do. A great point. Sorry. Thank you, Subhash. You're absolutely right. We do help you with the scopes of the We do. That's what Steve Asiala does. So yes. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, so the whole point of this is you input people in process, someone like the Idea Center, absolutely key, inventors and research dollars, you, good entrepreneurs, investors, subject matter experts. If you miss any one of these, it doesn't happen. You have to have all of these. And it's about getting them to a critical mass so that you can self-sustain the strategic flywheel. And you output more of each. And then you add a large base of operation for large corporations. So when we were at the University of Utah, we were at that scaling side where large corporations were buying our startups. And it was actually really cool because the start the company, the large company would buy a startup, they'd look at the area and say, you know, that's actually kind of a fun area to be. I'm not gonna move that startup, I'm gonna keep it there. And now they have a base of operation, they decide to expand and hire more people. Yay. How do you participate? <laughs> Submit your inventions. <laughs> Come to us. We would love it. This is our basic process. You submit it, we reassess the risks, we de-risk, we commercialize. You get to impact. Um, if anyone needs jobs, help the undergraduate students. Those who are interested in a job, come work with us. Learn how we do this. We'll show you how we do it. And you'll get paid to do it as well. You'll de-risk companies and technologies that we're working on right now. And you can work as analysts, entrepreneurial leads, uh, our tenants, we have uh, a tech park, 90,000 square feet, 72 companies, and during COVID, we had an increase in the number of companies wanting to come in because they loved the environment. Our occupancy rate is 93 to 94%. We have a wait list where, on average, the occupancy rate of spaces in this area is um, 30%. It's an ecosystem. People want to be around this ecosystem. It's very cool. And then come attend some really cool events. Uh, we have ID Week coming up in a couple of weeks. We tried really bringing in some great speakers, people who are really in the know, doing some really amazing research. Um, in the past, we were able to do a concert. Not going to happen this year. Sorry, we'll see what we can do in the future. But also, innovation rallies. The Friday before every home football game, we will usually bring in an investor, an entrepreneur, someone who's had a really good success. Um, you guys know the company Drizzly? Alcohol delivery? Okay, good for you. All right. No, <laughs> uh, uh, so Drizzly, alcohol delivery, uh, during COVID it was really popular. They sold for over a billion dollars recently. Uh, Notre Dame alum, that's the founder, he came in last year and talked to students and just said, this is my journey, this is what I did. And he's mentoring many of the students that he met there. Um, there's multiple examples of really cool startups that are doing some amazing things. I'm just going to highlight, given the time, I'm just going to highlight one. Um, Vital View, well, Simba, just an interesting side point. Simba, they, um, last year they raised $25 million on an $80 million pre-money valuation that works 105. That tied first place for the largest Series A raise in the state of Indiana history. And that's based on technology that's developed at the Center for Research Computing. Um, so very, very cool stuff. Uh, Vitalview, developed by Tom Pratt. It's a non-contact monitor of heart rate, respiration, total body water level for patients um, who are in heart failure. So if you're in heart failure, uh, you go to the ER usually because you just feel like crap. 
they tell you you're in heart failure, and they say to you, all right, you're in heart failure, and I want you to step on a scale every single day and make sure that you don't accumulate more than X number of pounds of water. And um, if you pick it early, if you notice that you're accumulating a couple of pounds of water early, they say, come to the doctor immediately, and we can give you diuretics and other medications and keep you out of the hospital. But if you pick it up late, there's a 50% chance, 40 to 50% chance you die. Um, people don't step on the scale. It's really hard, really, really difficult. So we built a monitor that sits underneath your bed, and it tells you the total body water, your heart rate, and your respiration based on the perturbation of radio frequency waves and the polar mode dispersion of those radio frequencies. Really, really quite cool. So we went out, we got the company last year, they raised $1.6 million. We built the prototype. The new beta prototype came in yesterday. It's really gorgeous looking. It looks awesome, I'm super excited. The faculty member, Tom Pratt, he used the previous prototype, took it to the Navy, delivered it to them. They said, I absolutely love it, and they gave him an extra million dollars to do work with that prototype. He also bought one of these, and he's going to take it back to the Navy, and we're hoping he gets more money. Because now he has a workable prototype, and the Navy doesn't have to build the development of it. They can just find the application of it. Anyway, so they're doing it. <laughs> you can, too. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Say, uh, Yoshi, for sure. Yoshi, Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, let's say like you have an idea after you graduate from Notre Dame and you have no idea where to like, you know, take your idea or how to move forward. Is it possible as an alumni to uh, bring the idea to the idea center or is that not? Is it only for like, current students? Yeah, no, unfortunately it's only for current students. Now if you're still in the community, yeah. yes in the community. If you're outside the community, we did have a process to do that, and um, you know, there's no, I'll be honest, the administration didn't care. I'm sorry. Right. I had, we had the process. It took a lot of effort, a lot of energy, and in the end, we just realized, talking to our customer, the customer didn't care about on that alumni piece from inventions. It doesn't mean they don't care about you, it just meant it was a really expensive program to run, but if you're in the community, yes, still a student, faculty, staff, yes. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to think back to that slide, impact on it. Yeah. The very top was sell product, make money. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be like a theme of everything, right? Um, university, though, is well known for its service. Yes. And how does a, a not-for-profit company play into this theme? And does the Idea Center uh, get into those types of companies? I'm so glad you asked. Um, we have only dabbled into it just a little bit. We're working with the Center for Social Concerns on building a process out that does not-for-profits as well. Now, the interesting thing about not-for-profits is you still have to make money. You just get your money from benefaction. Or it could be that you make money, but you don't use the profits to benefit individuals. You use the profits to work on your not-for-profit purpose. That's something that a lot of not for, uh, NGOs miss. Um, and in fact, uh, over at Keo, the Keo School of Global Affairs, there's a couple of really great researchers that are actually applying the Lean Launchpad methodology in helping not-for-profits and guide um, funding agencies to encourage them to, to adopt this model. Melissa Paulson and Paul Perrin, we've collaborated with both of them. As they go into other countries, Haiti, for example, uh, the, they tell the story of, um, they had a wall of shame. Paul Perrin was um, on Catholic Charities uh, response team to Haiti. And the wall of shame were uh, donations that actually cost them more money to get rid of. Uh, Gatorade, they were wonderful and they donated a container of Gatorade, powdered Gatorade. The biggest problem in Haiti was no clean water. So they had to dump it in the ocean. <laughs> but yes, um, I don't have a process yet. Uh, we've dabbled on it, but uh, yeah. Yes? So Notre Dame is investing all this money, time, resources into making these businesses happen, but what does Notre Dame receive? Good point. Actually, that's a really good point. It is all down. What they care about the absolute most is impact. That's what they care about. 
honest to goodness, had a great conversation with Shannon um, when we sat down, Shannon, our executive vice president, and he said, James, hey, if all of these companies do incredibly well, you have a great portfolio, our fund, and we have an investment fund with outside LPs, and the total value to paid in capital of that fund is actually one of the best in the country. Uh, we got lucky, we have great alumni, and we have great technologies. Um, and uh, it looks like it'll make a good amount of money. And Shannon said, well, how much money? If, if Simba and Vitalview exit, how much money would we make? And I said, well, about $50 million. And he said, that's it? Um, they're not interested in the money. They're interested in the impact. <laughs> a great point. Um, so what we do is we engage with regulatory consultants and we opt for the free meetings with the, I can't speak to the NRC specifically, um, it's been a few years since I've dealt with the NRC, we don't have a whole lot of inventions that I've dealt with, but I have the FDA, a lot of experience there. So what we do is we go, we reach out to the FDA, uh, we have the free meeting with them, or we hire a consultant and pay for it, and we, under, we get a feel for what they want in order to get us past regulatory. And, you know, the biggest thing I've noticed is um, the FDA, if you talk to them before you have your, your uh, complete proposal to them, they're actually really willing to give you exactly what they want. And it's often less than what you, would, what you think. So I had a company that's uh, it's got a modified um, uh, Grundle airway breathing device. So, you know, uh, out, so, uh, out, outpatient surgeries, plastic surgery, uh, foot and ankle surgery. Um, and it essentially has, it's really cool, two probes on it. Um, that one for CO2, one for O2. If you go to the doctor now, they have to take the O2 line, cut it, insert it into the airway, tape it, take the O2 line, cut it, insert it into the airway, tape it. it takes about four or five minutes to get it right so that you get um, a great O2 set and a really good CO2 waveform from the patient. Um, this just does it 30 seconds, 20 seconds. We thought it would be hard to get this through regulatory, so we met with the FDA two weeks ago. The FDA came back and said, oh, you know what, this is really cool. I really like this device. Um, do a mannequin trial, insert it down a few tubes, have a couple of doctors look at it, you know, 20, 30 grand, we're good. And of course, the next day, they're going to put that in writing. So they put it in writing, and now we're good. That's what we're doing. So it's not going to cost us, we thought it cost us a million. It's going to cost us 20 or 30 grand. Once again, ask them. Good question. Yes? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you covered this, but can you talk a little bit about, one, the cost for the students if they were to come to you, and then also some of the internal competitions that you guys have if they are moving their company? Yes. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you, Ginger. Um, so the cost for you, nothing. <laughs> Come as a student, there's nothing. Um, if you have a faculty innovation, we do all of that work for free, we're here to help you. All of that is nothing. If you have your own invention, risk assessment is free, and all we'd ask is, if you make it to risk assessment, um, we would ask for you to sign a, a, an engine agreement that gives us the ability to get up to 6% of your company, if we do a good job, and you're able to raise a million dollars in investment. If you don't, you know, what we say is, let us prove to you it's worth it. That's the cost. When it comes to the, the opportunities, um, we have hackathons on a regular basis. If you want to engage with student entrepreneurship and you have ideas, come with us, we'll help you. If you just want to be a part of the process, every single Friday over lunch is a, uh, an opportunity for inventors to pitch for funding, opportunity for, in, I'm sorry, entrepreneurs to pitch for funding as well as inventors. If you need 25 bucks up to $2,500, you can come in and pitch for funding. And the cool thing is, you all, the audience, decides who gets that funding. Not us. It's the audience that decides. You vote on who gets that funding. So anyway, you vote and you get the money. Um, you, Idea Week. You can come to Idea Week, do those fun events, uh, come to the Innovation Rallies. You're also welcome to just come over to Innovation Park and just hang out. Um, we have a lot of open space. We love it when students come over. You're more than welcome. We have uh, hot chocolate coffee, free hot chocolate coffee. Um, Lots of open space. We have an innovation lab. If you come up with ideas and you want to put your ideas down in paper, we have the world's largest 3D printer, production quality 3D, 3D printer. Um, a lot of 3D printers. We have uh, bed lasers. It's a four foot by eight foot laser bed. Um, I'm having a, I, my son's designing a custom grill for my Mustang. I'm so excited. Uh, we're going to laser it out, stainless steel. Anyway, if you want that, come on over. Your students. You're postdocs, you're part of the university. So yes, we'd love for you to be there. So 
where do the inventor typically, like here at Notre Dame, wind up in this process if they don't choose to become the entrepreneur? Usually the inventor, um, they either become a part of the, uh, the scientific advisory board, and for that they get a piece of equity. They also get a piece of anything the university makes. According to the intellectual property policy, a third of every dollar that we make goes to the inventors. Just, it's yours. Another third goes to the department and the, these are rough because it's a tiered thing. A third goes to the department and the college, and then a third goes to the pros. Um, what's interesting for us is, you know, we're counting on not getting any of that money, so we're working on building our endowment from equity that we get from our services so that we're cash flow neutral and we're making really good progress. So I think we need another three years and we'll be cash flow positive. Yeah, I think the. We have two more talks, and I was thinking maybe you'd want a little break here. So if there is no other question, we can move on to a short break. Uh, Bruce, thank you very much. It's a very exciting activity. I would encourage all of you actually to engage. Uh, everybody has a bit of inventor in them. Yes. So please take the, the opportunity to engage with them. Thank and, you. and thank you so much for your questions. I loved it.